38 in Australia. That's what they told me last night, so. But I, I told them we trade snow for heat, so. But I guess it didn't work out. Let's just stand, putting just thing aside. Uh, and any prayer requests as we turn to the Lord? Brother and Sister York, yes. And Marco. And uh, Brother Leon, he uh, sliced uh, his, his thumb or, uh, pretty good, so. And there may be others. All right, let's all lift up our voice to the Lord. He knows all things. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace. Lord, you see the different ones that has, Lord, a need to touch from thee. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're concerned concerning the things that has befall them, Lord, concerning the illness and the things of their body. But, Lord, there's other things as well. Lord, there's things of the mind and the soul. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would, your spirit would help and I leave yes. and strengthen each one, Lord, whether it be here or by the way of the Internet. Lord, you would have your way in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen. We see it this morning. I'm going to have a, our song leader to come up. I've given them that they have to choose among themselves who leads the song service. It's called sharing responsibility. And praise the Lord. Good to see everybody. I'm just uh, thinking when we're talking about prayer, uh, last week I was working on a cottage in uh, Casey Cape, and we were working uh, on staging. It wasn't very high, but I don't know, four feet probably, and uh, I was working on the plank, putting siding in the, the plank gave way. <laughs> Maybe I should go on a diet, but anyway, the, the plank gave way. And it broke, and I just fell like uh, straight down and wasn't prepared for the fall kind of thing. And uh, I hurt my ankle, and it was pretty sore. So I finished the day, and I got home, and it was getting, it was hurting quite a bit. And uh, we prayed over my ankle that night, and I woke up in the morning and completely forgot I had, uh, there was no pain. It was gone. It was just... Uh, because uh, the guys wanted me to go to the outpatients and have it checked out the day before, and I didn't want to go. And, but the Lord is great in mercy. So, uh, standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him. He the name. 
Sing number uh, 224. Do you want to keep it, play, play that in, John? You guys can help me along sing this song. Or maybe we'd start with the chorus. I'd rather live for him more than anything I know. More than houses and land More than riches untold And to gain this whole world And lose my soul I tell you my friend I'd rather live for him More than anything I know Anything. 
everything I know More than houses and things More than riches untold In this whole world And lose my soul
in the upper room with Jesus in the upper room Jesus in the upper room in the upper
Number 440. Jesus, the sweetest name. It's pretty high, though. <laughs> G, G. Start it. Sweetest name I know is just the same as his holy name is the reason why I love him so. Oh, man. 
grace has found us and he set us free. Worthy is he. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Elijah, do you have a song this morning? Thank you, Lord. Resurrection more He wants to set the captives free Oh, resurrection more Jesus won the victory And at the breaking of the dawn Oh 
Moses rolled the stone, but they said he walked away. Oh, Sunday we were in your broken hearts, echo the word they heard him say, don't wait for me, I'll live again on resurrection morning.
said, my Savior is on resurrection morn. Oh, resurrection morn. He awoke to set the captives free. Resurrection morn. Jesus won the victory. Sister Brenda, she's not here. Okay. Monique, do you have a song this morning? Thank you, Lord. I don't have my book, so I asked Diana not to go too far. Maybe.
Sister Brenda, do you have a song this morning? No? Okay. Everybody content? We're good. We're going to turn the service over to Fred. stand this time. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Fathers, we come to this part of the service. We thank you, Lord, for thy spirit here, the ministering this morning and songs. And I just pray, Lord, that you would continue using our brothers and sisters as you would see fit. Now, Lord, as we look into your word, use this vessel of clay as you would see fit. I ask it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we see it this morning? As I was, um, <clears throat> this week I looked at, uh, uh, they give reports on the, our site, and uh, so uh, Google, Google came back, or YouTube came back, and usually most of the sermons that I put up, I put it that it's not registered, they have to go through the website, but I must have forgot a few. So those two churches says they want to be associated with us. I don't know who they are. But Lord knows, just goes to show. But that's not what I'm here to talk about this morning. This morning I want to go to, in John, the, in, uh, yes, in John the 16th chapter. And starting at the 12th verse. Now Jesus has been talking to his disciples about many things, but now he comes to this place where he says, I have many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. Not because they could not hear his words from his lips that they couldn't bear. But they couldn't bear in the sense that it would be too heavy to, to know or to carry. It's just that time and conditions had not arrived. That it would be meaningless for them to bear something he would be projecting towards the future. And then he goes on to say, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now the spirit of truth is none other but the spirit of almighty God. We all have one father, and that's God. We are part of one family. And Jesus is the head of the church, but God is the head of Jesus. So the spirit of truth, that's why when we receive the spirit in us, when we're born again, we all have one father. And he's given to you and I to accomplish 
things in our lives that sometimes we look at miraculous things as being the most important thing, but the hardest thing or the most important thing to God is his word, his spirit to change you and I to be what he wants us to be. And he says, See, how be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, and that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Here he is in 33 A.D., he said they would show you things to come. And that saying of the truth of showing things to come would go from the day of Pentecost right up till we come to the rapture. The Lord knows. Now when he talks about showing things to come, As we would look through the grace age, wherever a person might have be standing in whatever period, of t- whatever period of time, he didn't say he would show you the things of the past that's already been revealed, but he would show you things to come in the future. That's how the spirit, the comforter, when he comes, that's how we know we have that Holy Spirit. Because looking things in the past, let's say the denominations, they look to their past. Their forefathers that set them up, the truth that they expound in their denominations. So they're always looking backwards. Some try to look forward at time, but only to have their fingers slapped and their revelation fall to pieces. So looking backwards, it's not what Jesus is talking about. Why do you say it would show you things to come? It would be the very means to try and test every believer, doesn't matter what age that you're in. Because showing things to come means it is new on ground. And there's no place you can run to to go see whether it's right or not. Except to the word of God and the spirit of God. You all feel quiet this morning. Now, when he says he'll show you things to come, we can look at that into different avenues as well. When we're talking about, well, I don't need a fivefold ministry, the Lord will show me everything I need. That's in contrary, contrary to the other scriptures. Because God talks about the preaching of the gospel was the means that he would bring things to come. Now, to a new child of God, as he comes to the altar and the Lord brings him to salvation, and he sees truth that we've seen for years. But to him, it is something new. But God's not going to take a child like that that's a babe and showing something to come that's prophetic for the whole bride. That's ordained to the ministry. And so is it within the ministry. God doesn't use a pastor to bring something new that the bride has not walked into that's for the whole bride. He'll use... In the case of Brother Brown, he was a prophet. In the case of Brother Jackson, it's an apostle ministry. And in the fivefold ministry, it would be the very same thing again. But I want to, as to give us a, an example, let's turn now to Matthew chapter 16. The hardest thing for any generation to see what God's doing is to accept the word that's on ground in your time. 
not what's been vindicated and brought forth in the past, but it's when it comes on ground. It causes every child, every minister, to know where they're standing with the Holy Spirit, that this is thus saith the Lord. Because hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, even the denominational church, even the Catholic church will quote some things from, from the book of Acts. Now, a lot of things are wrong, but they go back there. That's not a test. But when it was in the days of the apostle, when they start speaking things of truth, that was a, te- a very test to them. And so would it be all through the grace age, even up to the very end, God tests the generation with the word on ground in their day. We are not going to be tested on what Brother Jackson brought or what Brother Branham brought. Those things we need, and they're very important. But God's going to test this generation on what God's doing in this hour at the time we live in. In the Matthew chapter 16, it's a setting just to show that hindsight is 2020. Jesus was, was we're bringing it up in 16 verses, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came tempting, desiring to him that he would show them a sign from heaven. The reason they wanted a sign, because they weren't believing what he was saying. It's pure and simple. So they wanted proof what you're saying is true. So they wanted to have, but that was from a natural standpoint. There was, of course, the Holy Spirit wasn't given then. But yet, his disciples and those that walked with Jesus in that hour did receive it. But here, those that had been studied, that should have known or should have realized, they should have recognized who he was. So Jesus, he answers them and he said to them, he's pointing out their condition. He says, when it's evening, you say it will be fair weather. For the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today. For the sky is red and lowering. Now, Jesus didn't say a good word for them. He says, you hypocrites. They were depending on the things they could see with their mind, with things that was already established. Because many people, sailors in, well, there were sailors in those days, they would depend on the, the signs in the heavens, whether if it's red at night, I know I've been out in the water, if it's red at night, you're going to have a good day the next day. But if it's... Uh, Red in the morning, you better stay offshore, stay on shore. But anyway, he says, all you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't not discern the signs of the times, T-I-M-E-S. Remember last week we spoke about times and seasons? Now, for them, for the Pharisees, their condition, their case was sitting in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. The angel Gabriel told Daniel there would be 70 prophetic weeks. He gives them a certain explanation, saying there would be seven weeks into building the temple. He breaks... Gabriel breaks it down, and here's, he's looking at 70 weeks. So he says, in the first uh, 49 years, if you want to where the first seven weeks would be the temple would be built. And from on there, it would be 62 weeks when the Messiah would come. And they should have understood, and they knew those weeks, because there was other things prophesied about how they would be in Babylon for 70 years and so forth. But here's a prophecy sticking in their face. They rather believe what Moses said than believe one of their prophets, Daniel. And had they been open their heart to God and seeking God in the right way, 
instead of trying to figure things out and making commandments of men and, and procedures and whatever they were doing. They didn't see their day. So Jesus is, is rebuking them and saying, you, can, you know how to read the signs. You can quote Moses all the time. But you can't see you're at the 69th week. Because their eyes were blinded from them. And that was the word for their day at that hour. He was testing them. So this sets up an example as that is used as an example they were to recognize what was on ground for their period of time. And because they don't recognize their time they just speak against things that would be true for their day. And that has played out all through the first church age. There's always those that says, well, who do you think you are, Paul? Where do you get these revelations? And Jesus didn't say that. Moses didn't say that. But those that had the Spirit of God in them could see the reality of the things that Paul brought in, in the epistles he wrote. And preachers of every age has done the same thing. They cannot discern the signs of the times. The denominations. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole Middle Ages and find out of every detail. I'm bringing it up to date to now. In the days of Brother Branham, those that should have seen that God was going to send a prophet, they should have seen Malachi Chapter 4. They didn't open, they weren't, let's say, open to hear what he had to say and to, to check with the scripture. Because in them is a spirit already. It's an anti spirit. Because when something is said that's not with the spirit of God, it becomes anti. And as Brother Brown now start preaching, the, the word to them, not in the 48 when he came, or 47, but when he came after 1960 onward, as he's speaking the word, tongues is not an evidence. Instead of looking to the scripture and rejoicing, they ganged up on him. Because that's what was going on at that period of time. That tested the movement. And so therefore, as Brother Branham passes off the scene of the element that's seen, the things that what the Lord had brought through that prophet, as he's passed off the scene, now God raised up another man. Again, the same problem. No sooner did Brother Jackson start bringing out those seven things that the Lord showed him to speak about, the Branham movement started to speak against him, because that's a way that identifies the Antichrist spirit. He's all, the Antichrist spirit will always go and try to deny, to, to tear down, or, or to diminish the influence of what God's doing on ground. And so the preachers in the, that came out of the Brandon Movement, when Brother Jackson started ministering the word of God to them, Bingo. They were, they were throwing things at them, and I, I, you've heard his testimony where he mentioned different, in some places. Well, they say, you're not a prophet. You can, how can you bring things like that? 
You're not an apostle. Not like, Pe- like Paul and Peter. How can you bring things like that? And so when he did bring things out, instead of if they had the, the Spirit of God in them, look at it in the proper way, they would see the picture. And the picture with things on ground, you could actually see what's transpiring. How it was beautiful, the things that we got taught from 1963. What a wonderful time. And so now we move on a little further. And while Brother Jackson till 2004 started to minister all the wonderful things that we've had, and he passes off the scene, now it's a turn for another stage, the fivefold ministry. And let there be apostles stand on the scene in the time of the fivefold ministry. You got the same thing that's happened to Brother Branham, that happened to Brother Jackson. It's happening in this hour right now. There's always opposition. But it's a means of God to test to you and I what's actually transpiring. Is this fresh water or was this, this before? Okay, thank you. I didn't know for sure. Why would God use three stages? Now, I'm not preaching the thing Brother Stroman talked about, but there would be three aspects God would be speaking concerning the coming or to have a people to watch in the days of, since Brother Branham, of watching and, and what, yes, people has always been watching. Well, maybe I should start a little. Now, we looked at the times and the seasons. When Jesus... In, that's in Acts chapter 1, verse 7. When Jesus says, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. He's speaking, yes, to Jews. But these Jews were to be part of the bride. And as he speaks of them way back in 33 AD, after his resurrection, uh, as he's speaking to his disciple before he leaves the earth, they want to know when is this going to end, or when what, these things that you talked about in Matthew chapter 24, when are these things going to transpire? He says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Now that's in the language of that day or the hour. But in today's language, it would be centuries and decades. And so... Centuries would go by, but remember when God does something, when he identifies a certain period of time, it has to be with something that's transpiring on ground at the time. It can't be just any old date, well, let's pick this area here or that area here and try to put something together. If we turn to Luke chapter 12, and I know I went over this, this before a bit, but I want, there's other things I want to bring in here this morning. So we're in Luke, the 12th chapter. The setting is verse 36. And ye yourselves liken unto men when waiteth for the Lord, when he will return from the wedding, and when he will come and knock and immediately open up to him. The initial him returning. His returning has nothing to do with his physical second coming. It has nothing to do with coming for the rapture, the rapture itself. But he is definitely coming and has come in First Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. When that shout came, you can look at 1963. 
That was the beginning of knowing that the Lord is on ground. Now, the next verse goes through a process of time from the ministry of Brother Branham till the end. Blessed are those servants when the Lord, when he cometh, finds watching. Verily I say unto you, he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Like I said, it started with the ministry of the prophet when the seals, the church ages, and other things he was bringing in in that hour. But then it fell mainly of the feeding of servants was now mainly under the ministry of Brother Jackson. And will come to serve them. Now here's, for a long time, I looked at verse 38 and wondered, where is it pertaining to? And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so blessed are those servants. So these watches... We're going to find out they're watches of the night. Remember those circles that the Holy Spirit drew when Brother Brown was there and showing it was very dark on the last one? That's about the midnight hour. And so why would Jesus say, well, there's a second watch, he said that, and there's a third one. But where in the world is the first one? If we put that parable along with Matthew chapter 25, uh, 25. Now in Matthew chapter 25, from verse 1 to verse 5, that's at the turn of the century. From 1906, when the pouring out of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. There would be five wise and five foolish. They were all together in, in the same churches. There would, God had not caused nothing to separate them. All the believers are intermixed in, as the move of God would go from 1906 up to the time Brother Branham comes on the scene. Now here, it says... And at midnight, there was a cry made. At midnight. Now we can look at it as a time on the watch. Yeah, it's, it's midnight, it's 12 o'clock. But as a background, and there's, there's Mark, uh, I believe, there's a scripture that depicts about this, the watches of the night. And the watches of the night it's not like we have in our calendar here today or, or how people devise up the night for certain watches as if you're in the military as you're watching over things and so forth. But it, from the days of the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire up to the time of Jesus, the military and the world at that hour looked at the watching, means you're watching for something, not just the, the, watch, it's the watch time, it were for watching, was divided in four periods in the night. Okay, so there would be the midnight watch, there would be the second watch, and the third watch, from midnight to three, from three to, to six o'clock in the morning. So here it's talking about that first point, or that first period of time. At midnight, there was a cry made. Okay, that midnight, the, the cry was made, but... It was says, get ready. And so they knew from the 1906 when the God poured out the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues that the Lord's coming, but they had no idea when, where, how long. Or they could even believe maybe it was in their time frame. 
But then now God adds a little bit more understanding. He says, in this verse here, he says, but at midnight there was a cry. How many know when that cry started? The cry is not the shout. The cry started in 1947. That started preparing a people from 1947 on down to about 1960. Or till Brother Branham came and started opening things up to you and I, showing that he was the Malachi 4. He was that first part to return back the hearts of the, the, uh, the children back to the forefathers, fulfilling that picture. So this was during the midnight cry, or the first, what, what, was, what was this what, uh, cry about? It's to watch when the Lord would return. So it is a watching for the true children of God to look, to looking, looking for him. But they only had so much details and understanding in how to look when he would come. And what really cemented things in place is when God used Brother Branham to reveal six of those seven seals. So then now the bride knew exactly where she was standing at. It was through that prophetic ministry of Brother Branham I, as I stand before you this morning, that is the first watch. But the reason that is the first watch, because reason Jesus had, there had to be a reason why Jesus said, well, there's a second and a third. Well, what is this all about? It's just watch to measure time. It's watching for the Lord's coming. In the first watch, as people are watching, they only knew up to a certain point of how close they were living to the Lord's coming. If the Lord knew that that's all was needed with that first watch, the rapture would be already taking place. But he knew people wouldn't be made ready. And so a second watch, what is a second watch? Are more people watching in the sky? No. Now God gives more detail and information of watching for his coming. And definitely through the ministry of Brother Jackson, an apostle ministry, the bride now sees a whole lot more clear during from 67 to 2005. That's your second watch. Because if we're saying a watch, something on ground has to exemplify what it is. You just can't say, well, one, two, and three. One was the ministry of Brother Branham. People were watching in that revelation for that hour. But that's all he knew, and that's all God required. Then when he moved in Brother Jackson, now it's the second hour. People are watching with a greater revelation of his coming. Right? Then when he passes off the scene, now it's the turn for the fivefold ministry. It's the third watch. And he says, he never told them that he would come and take them in that first watch. Because he doesn't mention the first watch in Luke. He doesn't say he's going to take them in the second watch. If he did take them in the second watch, there would be no third there would be no reason for a third one. I mean, you don't need to be spiritually revelated to know that. If there's a third one, there's a reason why there's a third. So he said, Watch, he says you don't know whether he's coming in the second or the third. Well, it's going to be in the third that the Lord's going to actually be going to be coming. Now, in each one of those watch, God brings up the revelation of concerning his coming up to a point. Then when he moves in the second watch, he gets more understanding of revelation. When is that coming? And in the days of Brother Jackson, oh, how we were excited about 2004. But God had allowed that. Not that we were depending on the date now, but we were depending on events to transpire for 2004 for the week of Daniel to arrive. But we didn't have all the information. God did not ordain it to be revealed at that hour. And so Brother Jackson now passes off the scene. Now we have the bride in this hour. And we are now in 
well, in this, after this month, it's 2017. That's quite a, been quite a bit of time. Because we're living in 2017, had Brother Jackson been living in this hour, he would have known 2004 had nothing to do from 33 to this time here. But definitely now, I've heard comments, well, nobody knows that it, it, it didn't come out for, for Brother Jackson. Well, the prophetic events are still true. But that means you don't throw the baby with the bathwater out of the window either. Because God's now, it's not testing Brother Jackson's generation, he's testing this generation. It just can't be open-ended out there somewhere as well. We know the three prophetic things. Those that believe in the third day, they don't have no clue when it, when, how close they're getting to it. So is there anything in the scripture that we can look at it from a scripture point of view that would make sense when the Lord would actually come? So as we look, we were looking at centuries and decades. We know Hosea 6 and 2. And the church ages in chapter 2. Is the same time frame identical? Because you now, and here's, I know someone's going to take this and go wild, but let them go wild at only at their own peril. Yes, when God showed Brother Brown 53 AD, and he took that from uh, Claire and Larkin, but God had allowed it to be used that. Because what is it looking at? He's looking at the Ephesian church as being the start of that first age. Not when the first bride came in from 33, but he's he's talking about Gentile church. Not Gentile individual, a church. So Paul, as he arrives in Ephesus, and he's at the school of Tyrannus, and he's there for teaching for over two years, two and a half years, in its infancy, when he started in that school, yes, that was the church at Ephesus, but it was in its baby state. But after two and a half years of him ministering every day in that school, now a group of believers are brought full grown, which caused it to be a light to be spread out through Asia Minor. So what God looking, now we... Don't know from a scriptural standpoint, is God looking when Ephesus started or when Ephesus was now a full grown church? So it could be anywhere from 53 to 57. And I kind of agree with Brother Jackson, I believe it's around 56. Because that would be at the time that the maturity of that Ephesian church would be the beginning of that Ephesian church age. That don't change anything for Brother Branham. Because God had just put a picture of ages in, in, in time frame. Now in the, and now in the hour we're living in that third watch, we need to know a little bit more concrete when these things are going to be transpiring. I know it's in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. So, for those by way of the internet, don't go calculating 53 and I can calculate when the the Lord's actually coming. You can't do it that way. God allowed it. So, we will know the season or the decade, but you won't know the day or the hour. If we go down that road to find the actual day and the hour, we're going to do like those that went before us and gone off track. So we know about about the time that it should finish, from 23 to 27. That's all I'm saying this morning. So now as we're in, when we looked at the time and the seasons and the decades, really, it becomes more crucial 
as time goes on, to know more about when the Lord is actually coming. When that first watch came, no longer, as we look at what Jesus stated in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, it's not for you to know the, time, the, season, the times and the seasons. The times are over as far as there is no more another century to go on. Impossible with all the things we know from the scriptural standpoint. The, we're in the last part of that. Now we're into that last part that would be the century, if you want to, where now it's going to be divi- we're going to be looking at seasons or decades when things are going to transpire. Are you following so far? And when I say it's in that decade, what I'm going to be speaking in a minute, it doesn't mean it has to be a decade. It's the last decade. So when Israel became a nation in one day, we know it would be the last generation. A generation is not one decade, is it? It's, you don't live just 10 years unless God takes you home. So we know it would be seasons, plural, or decades. And when we look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, when it says, when you see the fig tree put forth another branch, that's one statement of that, that paragraph. But Jesus also says, and when it puts forth more leaves, it didn't put the leaves in 48, it put the leaves in 67. And when Jesus said, that generation shall not pass away till all things be fulfilled, the generation of 1948 cannot, you can't, there's not enough time for it. It's, it's over for that, for, that, for that period of time. So it's a generation really from 67. So we're still talking about seasons and decades. Those that were about 20 years old when Israel became uh, the owners or the masters of the city of Jerusalem were still in the terms of decades. And that's in the time of Brother Jackson yet. So we had more information on which, what, how to watch, which watch we're in. So that is pointing to you and I being that second watch. But when 2005 came about, God allowed 2004 date to fall through, but these events that was to be supposed to be in it are still true and holds up water. Now, I may be going on a limb, but it don't matter. When that miracle war takes place, it could be next year or the year after. We don't know when it is exactly. When that miracle war takes place, I'm telling you this morning, you're in the last decade. It doesn't mean it's going to last 10 years, but you're in that last decade now. And we know the Lord's coming. And now... In that last decade, because it's near at the time that we get to know more information of our departure from this world. So from that miracle war, yes, it's very short, maybe done in a a week or a number of days. But the wall has to come down from the, that's devised the Arabs now. They will no longer be against Israel, they'll be for Israel. The temple goes up. But here's the other part. All those other Jews that are, that are out in the other land that has not come home because there's no room for them, that miracle war opened up the whole area for them, the whole territory. So for people to move, be established, be put in there, you don't do that in 24 hours or six months. So that's going to take a bit of time to be established. Well, how long is that going to be, brother? I don't know. It could be three, four years. Don't go putting that to the bank. 
But I'm just saying you have to allow on ground what can actually happen. You, have, you can't have to say, well, it's going to happen in two weeks' time. I, the Lord just told me. No, it won't. Reality won't allow it. Now, it's not reality is over the Bible, over God's word, but somewhere is God's word. He brings in what is reality. Now, brothers and sisters, when the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 takes place, what happens then? The thunders are going to be brought forth. And when Ezekiel 38 and 39, let's say you're, the war ends and the, and the first thunder didn't sound yet, you're, you know, the war just ended and on day one here, you're just standing there just after that war. That ought to tell us there's now, there's much less of a decade left, a whole lot. And the only thing that's going to hold things back is the time it would take for those thunders. And in those thunders is going to be information that's going to let us know now not just a decade, it's going to let us know even up to the, near to the month. Because Jesus didn't say we would not know the month. But we don't start figuring out what the month will be before we reach Ezekiel 38 and 39. When we have reached there, we know there's thunders. Well, Brother Fred, they got all the internet and the thunders can be done in two weeks' time. No. First of all, it's got to be digested. Things have to be on ground that it's related it to as well. And so as these, as the thunders are unfolding, not everybody's got the internet. Yes, here in North America, praise the Lord, Australia, Norway, but there's other places that are people that wants that God may have, may have, God has bride people somewhere in the world that they may have to take the mail route. Okay? I'm not saying they're that extreme, but and so therefore, when the thunders takes place, and we, we can see as it affects the bride and as she's digesting this, living this, seeing what's taking place, what's told to her, then you can look in terms of months. But in all that, at that point in time where the thunders are fo- unfolding, let us not say we're going to know the date or the hour. Because Jesus himself says, of that date knows no man, not even himself. So this is all transpiring in the third watch. We have not reached the last decade yet, but it's coming. Because right now, if... I'll put it this way. If the two days of Hosea is not the Gentile church age, you can only look at there maybe, well, maybe there may be four, five, six decades that that thing could transpire because we don't see things happening in the way we, because things have not come on ground yet. But remember, all these watches that Luke talks about, yes, he only speaks about the second and the third, we're watching for his coming, and how do you watch for his coming? Well, I got, a, I got some good binoculars. I can see, uh, I, look, I read the paper, uh, I can see the... No, that has nothing to do with it. We're watching with the revelation that the, instilled in the bride that she knows what time she's living at. And because God's allowing this to bring on ground you're going to have an anti-spirit speak against it. It's no different than when Brother Brandon was on ground. No different when Brother Jackson was on ground. They've done the same thing. Because when we look at it in, in reality, who fed Brother Branham? Was it his word or the Lord's? Brother Jackson, was it his words or the Lord? And in the five-fold ministry, oh, well, the Lord's not speaking to nobody no more. 
No, he is speaking. And if he is speaking, has he said anything? Now, to some, it's not to my liking, so I don't think he said anything. That don't make it any less real than what Jesus, when he was talking to the Pharisees, or Brother Bram talking to the denominations, or Brother Jackson talking to the Brandon movement. And in this hour, even though you might have come out of, the, of Brother Jackson's movement, this movement is not immune from discerning the, the times and the signs. The signs are not there for us to set a date. We're going to be setting dates. But how in the world can you watch for the Lord's coming if you don't know when? Or things that, see, it's like traveling to a, in a car going to a city. You see signposts as you get nearer and nearer. You see objects that get nearer. You know you're watching and closer you're getting near that city. Well, it's the same thing in this hour. As we watch closer, we get nearer and nearer to the time of our departure. It shouldn't be a surprise because in Matthew chapter, I'll just quote it, Matthew chapter 13, verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear, and ye shall not understand. Not because they don't understand, they don't want to understand. And seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. That's one aspect of the Spirit of God. It's perceiving what he's doing. When you look back at the past, that's not perception. How many needs to perceive what happened in the past? but perceives things that are coming on ground and are taking place. And, the, and it's not because of a, the natural perception in our, in our minds or in our, our makeup, but it's the Spirit of God causing the believer to perceive, I see this. I'm living at that hour. I'm moving on with the Lord. I didn't think it would go. Usually the Lord starts with something. Then it opens up a bit more. And a bit more. At the hour that we stand now. Can you see that you're. Nearing, we're, we're not there at the last decade, but you can't say, well, this is the last decade because uh, uh, I read the newspaper. It has to be associated with what God does on ground. So that miracle war is not just knowing that it is a revelation that God has given to us, but it also is a point. Where God, when now it's signaling to the bride, when that happens, she'll know the decade. You couldn't know the decade in Brother Brown's day. There was not enough things opened up to see that. In Brother Jackson's day, yes, there's that miracle war, but it is somewhere, as it was looking towards 2004, but that did not transpire. Now, God allowed that for people to be tested are you leaning on flesh because he said it or because God has shown him something? God did show him the revelation, but it was not a date. And in this hour, if you can't lean on flesh either, it's got to be the Spirit of God that makes it real to you or to me. I preach a message. There's no place to hide. When God brings something on ground, when Jesus spoke to those Pharisees, you can recognize this, the sky when it's red and it's going to be fine weather. 
But you can't tell when, the da- when Daniel chapter 9 is being fulfilled. That's in that hour. What is it in this hour? Well, uh, y'all for quiet. Either you're taking it in, or you're saying, he's gone bananas. But somewheres, if there's no place to hide, when the God's word comes on ground, either we will walk in it, or we'll speak against it. Now, God will allow for a certain space of time things to be spoken against it. To give an opportunity for people's eyes to be opened up. But after it's gone for a while, it's sad to say that it's an anti-spirit. Could be just as revelated as you are. Could quote the scriptures better than you can. Can outdo you, outdance you, out, outperform. But one thing it can't do. It can't tear down a true revelation. If what I'm speaking to you this morning is false, God will raise someone with the scripture showing that is error. But if it can't be brought down, then know that God has been opening up a picture to you and I. I know that, and when he gives it, when he talks about the comforter come, he'll show you things to come. That's even applicable in this hour. Not show you things of the past, because you came into that knowledge of the past. I see it in industry too. That a company wants to change things and bring something new, and boy. You got some people, yes, good, oh, great. Others, no way, we've seen this before. You have the naysayers, and you have those that will see, the, see whether it is genuine. Now, if they're, if they're bringing something new and it's just an idea that somebody's just trying and, and falls to the ground, well, it's going to fall to the ground. But if it is something that will help the company, then it helps the company. And so, so is it in the hour that we live in. I know that there's times that I, f- I feel, yes, a lacking on my part to preach salvational type messages. But I feel it's important to see where we're at too. And I, this is not the only ministry that's here. There's other ministries on the internet you can have access to. But open your ears and perceive what's right and what's wrong. I mean, we're at the end. We're not novice anymore. Now, granted, there may be young people, new people come in, but the bride as a whole, they're not beginners. If you're at the beginner stage, I'd have to say, what have you been doing all these years? And Jesus spoke one day, he said, in John chapter 3, verse 31, He that cometh from heaven is above all, and what he hath seen and heard he testifieth, and no man receives his testimony. They weren't receiving Jesus' testimony. Why? They should have. He was clear enough. He was honest enough. And he also had the Spirit of God Because, Father, make them one as we are one. He was one. Now, there's something, there's another area of the scripture there, too. The oneness. They're one in purpose, the Lord and Jesus Christ. Their spirit merge, but it's in its full measure, or fuse, or whatever words you want to use. 
To you now we have it by measure. So when Jesus says make them one like we are one, he's talking about that Holy Ghost working for the same purpose. And that Holy Ghost, that comforter, will cause you and I to perceive not the past, but the hour we're living in. He'll lead you into all truth. He'll show you things to come. If you're in a denomination, they can only show you what things that were in the past. There's nothing new. Oh, but they say, we got something new. We, 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 uh, we, we uh, preach salvation in, in a new way. So it's a new revelation. No, it's not. It's a revelation just as you expound it in a different manner. But you didn't bring forth anything new that was never revealed before. And the thing that God's looking at in this, in this hour, and it brings back to the book of Revelation. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? It's the spirit of prophecy, right? Prophecy is what? Concerning things to come. It can pick things from the past that was never revealed, but mainly showing things to come. Well, maybe I said enough for this morning. I could have went in a whole lot of different directions, but in John fifteen twenty six, says, "But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send to you." Now, this is Jesus speaking. It's from the Father. Father, make them one like I'm one with you. Even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father. That's why when we pray, we don't pray to Jesus, we pray to the Father, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to include him in the picture, because that's who in and through God is working through. He that is the make, builder and maker is God, right? To place us in Christ. Oh, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> If I get going down that road, you're going to be here for another half hour. But these things we know, these things we cherish, and they're important for you and I in our lives. And getting, as we're getting near this time period here, let's not do like students in school. Not every student does that, but some do. They wait till the last minute to cram to get things ready. When is the time for you and I to get ready? If there's something in your and my life, how sincere are you about it? Well, we talk about faith, which I spoke a little bit last week about. If we just Take, as the Spirit would come to deal with us, rest assured, you can rest on that. But it takes an, uh, something on our part to believe it, to walk in it. And God will make it materialize. But if I'm, yeah, I'm sincere today on Sunday, but come Tuesday, well, I don't know, Lord, you, you know I'm having problems. No. Don't go by your feelings. What is faith? It's a revelation. And what is a revelation? Something that the Spirit of God imparts to you, the individual. I mean, I kind of like that part there. And what he imparts to you at that time is what he wants you to, or I to work on in that period of time. No, Lord, I don't think I want that. It's just another thing that I want to deal with. No. Who can make the changes? Can we change our lives? No. But he can, if we allow him, in his way, how he leads us. So praise the Lord. Uh, maybe I'll stop here because we'll save that for another day. But you see, in Luke he says the second watch and the third watch. He didn't mention the first one. There's a reason for that. But why did he say second? And even a third? And it's not watching on 
watch, or is this part of the midnight we had calculated the date. It's watching, it's, con on, it's mainly concerning the watching of his coming in a revelatory understanding. That's as best as I can try to expound it to you this morning. Well, let's just stand at this time. Have the musicians to come. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you once again. Lord, for the things that you've done for us, how you've led us thus far. Now I pray, Lord, use the words that you would see fit. We ask it now in your precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. Praise the Lord, we're thankful for the nuggets that he allows us to see, the picture he allows us to see, and uh, thankful for the ministry. Just want to tell you I'm thankful for all that you have done. Happy as happy as can be 
When I think of Jesus and all He's done for me, something in my heart. Thank you, Lord. My sword, my shield, He's my wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Makes no difference what they say. I'm going down on my knees and pray. And I'll pray, pray, pray to Jesus come. He's my rock, my sword, my shield. He's my wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's the lily of the valley. The bright and morning star makes no difference to what they say. I'm going down on my knees and pray. And I'll pray, pray, pray to Jesus come. He's my rock, my sword, my shield. He's my wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's the lily of the valley. The bright and morning star makes no difference in what they say. I'm going down on my knees and pray, and I'll pray, pray, pray to Jesus God. Just a little longer, and the trump of God will sound. Just a little longer, and my love be glory bound. Look away to Jesus, our redemption draw at night. Just a little longer, and we'll meet Him. The trump of God will sound just a little longer, and my love be glory bound. Look away to Jesus, our redemption to rob at night. Just Just a little longer, and the trump of God will sound. Just a little longer, and we'll all be glory bound. Look away to Jesus, our redemption draw at night. Just a little longer, and we'll meet Him in the sky. Do you have something, John? Do you have a song?
Let's just stand at this time. I don't know about you, but I'm having more of a comfort how we're getting to the time when the Lord's coming. Praise the Lord. Brother Ray, if you come and dismiss the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time. Thank you for your visitation and your faithfulness to us. Heavenly Father, as we dismiss and go our several ways, we pray that you would give us traveling mercies. Be with your children this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.